This is your second installment of the God and Country class, Sneak Preview Edition. <coughs> We're going to talk about uh, economics more so this week. Last week we spoke about uh, more of our godly heritage and our founding fathers, etc. This week more the economic side. Of course, in our God and Country class, uh, we're talking about America's godly heritage, good economics, and the proper role of government, and our little motto, snacks, friends, and saving the country. So thanks to the Boltons for providing the home and the snacks. Now we're going to proceed to save our country. So thinking about economics, is it necessary? Is it important? Uh, what's the big deal? Uh, you could all be doing something else right now. You could be spending your time uh, watching some sort of cooking show or, or doing homework or any other thing. Why is this possibly a good idea to be spending your time thinking about economics? What is economics, first of all? My definition is basically buying and selling things to meet each other's needs. So money is involved, but it's not all about money. It's about people trying to figure out what they can do to serve you and when they serve you, you give them money, you see. So it's a marketplace of people buying and selling things to meet each other's needs. Okay, it's not too complicated, right? So do economics matter? Well, do you have a job? Do you like your job? Do you want another job maybe one day? How much of your pay do you get to keep? What taxes do you pay? Uh, how much can you pay someone else? Can you just pay him anything you want? What state will you live in? What happens when you die? Didn't know you'd be talking about that tonight, but economics has to do about that too. Uh, what, do, what do economics affect? Well, what kind of house you can live in? How much food you can buy? What kind of car you can drive? What you can give your kids? Uh, how much you can give to church? How much you can support missionaries? Uh, what kind of health care you can have? What kind of education you can give your children? In short, it affects practically every area of your life. You want some more dance shoes? That's economics, okay? You want to go on a trip? That's economics. You want to buy another guitar, like I do? That's economics. It's all economics. So do you have a job? Well, this is a chart of the developed nation's corporate tax rates. Uh, essentially, the government can take money from almost every area that it finds that money is being transacted and one place is businesses so business makes some money and the government says well give us some of that we want some of that money out of all the developed nations in the world the United States of America has the highest corporate income tax rate what that means is that out of any other country in the world that people might do business America is the least competitive in other words we're the worst and now you think about this as the home of the brave, okay, land of the free. Okay, we, we marched on D-Day and we beat back the Germans and we fought back against the Japanese in World War II. And then what did we do to ourselves? We shot ourselves in the foot. And we said, let's actually make ourselves the least competitive nation we can be in the world. So what does that mean? That means that, let's just say, 40% of what a company makes and profits, they've got to give to the government in America. Now contrast that with Ireland here. 12.5%. So if you're thinking about starting a new business, where are you going to think about starting it? America? It's going to be the last place. Okay, compared to Ireland, you get to keep almost 30% uh, more of your money if you set up shop in Ireland rather than in the United States. Now I'm not sure, but I believe Facebook may have even uh, set up their headquarters in Ireland. Probably for this reason. So what does that mean? That means that that's 40% less jobs a company can, can offer. So that means 40% less pay they can give you when you're working for them. 40% less they can invest back into the company, creating new products, uh, innovating, taking care of what, what sort of equipment they already have. So whatever it is, that's 40% less they can do with. So basically that means 40 cents out of every dollar that a corporation makes goes to... Essentially, that's a good way to look at it. That's right. That's right. And the way that they look at that, by the way, is a federal and then pretty much an average of what states could charge because a state can or, or maybe won't have a corporate income tax rate of their own. So they take the average of what the states have plus the federal, and we've got almost 40% when you do that. And 
does that include regulations on top of that? Oh no, that would not be the regulatory burden. That's a whole another issue. But that's a great question. That's a whole another issue. Oh yeah. Now though, this is just one thing, one one tax. All that is a whole another heap. Let's just say you do have a job. How much of your pay do you actually get to take home? Well, this is just an example. This is someone's uh, someone's little pay slip at the end of the end of the two week period. You've got federal income tax. They took a chunk off of that. Social Security tax, they took a check off for that. Federal Medicare took another bit. Now your state may or may not have a, a state income tax. Uh, some states do, some states don't. And this one's Maryland. So we've got one in Virginia. So you've at least got four different categories where something is taken out. And that's because you don't even see that money in most cases. What other taxes do you pay? Some call these things hidden taxes because you don't see them unless you really look for them. Um, except for this one, this is uh, upper upper left here. This is an example of someone's uh, property tax bill. Uh, my vehicle is garaged, so to speak, uh, up in Fairfax, Virginia. So just last week, I paid them the money so that I can keep on owning my car. So I paid for my car a number of years ago, but I've got to keep on paying the local city that I live in because I still own it. If that isn't the silliest thing I've ever heard of in my life, you own something, so keep on paying taxes on it. That's absurd to me. Um, across here, you've got a wireless bill, by the way. Uh, this is your, your cell phone bill. If you just start at the top, you've got a state sales tax, local sales tax, MCTD sales tax. I don't even know what that is. State excise tax. An excise, uh, another word for excise is a sin tax. So when they, when they charge uh, extra for cigarettes or something like that, or a luxury boat, that's an excise tax, okay? So I guess they think talking on the phone is, is a sin. Or, or they, 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 think, they think this is a luxury that they're going to tax extra. So there is a, a state excise tax. You've got another excise surcharge. You've got a local utility gross receipts tax. Uh, you got two 911s, local and state. I don't mind paying for 911. That's, that's useful. But you got 911 taxes. Uh, MCTD surcharge, a New York State franchise tax, uh, school district utility sales tax, universal service tax, and so at the bottom of that, that's 23% of your of your bill. Now this is just an example, so this isn't universal, but all those are taxes of some sort. I don't even know what they go to, most of them, but they're on your cell phone bill. And can you call and say, hey, I didn't, I didn't ask for that? No, it's on there. There's nothing you can do about that. Uh, I'm pretty sure that one of these, and maybe the universal sales tax, is a tax that everyone pays so that other people can get cell phones for free. That, that's one of them. That's one of the government programs is it goes to someone else getting a free cell phone. And you're paying for it, and you have no choice if you want a cell phone. What else do you have here? You've got uh, a cable. Well, no, what is this? This is a, yeah, this is your cable bill. Uh, so you got your basic TV adjustment. Okay, that was something on there. You got a franchise fee administration fee, you got a, another federal excise tax, so they think it's a sin to watch TV too. Uh, federal Universal Service Fund, this may be so people can have free TV, who knows. Uh, but you got a state excise tax, sales tax, etc. Alright, so just to have TV, you're paying taxes. Over here, uh, this is an example of what goes into your price of gasoline. Okay, so when you see 342, whatever the price is, well, 48% of that may be actually to turn it into gasoline, right? 17% may be what they pay to market it and to get it out there, etc. Now that big old uh, Texas, you know, millionaire, that oil tycoon with the longhorns on the front of his Cadillac, well, you may think he's getting rich off of all this stuff, but look, look at his little sliver. It's 3%. Right now, this is just an example, but what's one of the big, what's the second biggest chunk out of that? Taxes. taxes. Exactly. Taxes. All right. So this is in every, according to this little example, uh, about 30 cents of every dollar that you pay. So if that's a $3 gallon of gas, you've got 90 cents of that is taxes. All right. So if you are upset about gas prices, think the government. Minimum wage laws. How much can you pay somebody else? All right. If I want some kid to mow my lawn, okay, if the federal government got involved, I would have to pay him about seven dollars and twenty-five cents. 
So you can't just pay someone whatever you want to pay them. There's a law for that. All right? And we're going to talk about in the future what happens when the government gets involved in fixing prices and, and what happens when they set ceilings for things and floors for things, so to speak. So you can't just pay someone any old price to do something, according to the government. This is a, a chart recently from the American Legislative Exchange Council. Uh, this is a group in Washington, D.C. I actually worked for them for about six and a half months. And every year they rank the states in terms of economic, uh, basically their forward-looking rankings and how well they did the last year. Out of 50 states, who's the worst? Who do you see on there that was ranked the worst? New York. New York. New York loves being last. <laughs> Has anyone seen a, a recent commercial that New York State is putting out there on TV? Yeah. yeah. Well, they're, they're basically trying to get people to come to New York with a 10-year tax break, basically. And it's for certain industries in certain locations. And after 10 years, you'll be taxed the regular rate. But they're trying to say they're a great competitive state for doing business. And yet, they're number 50. All right, California's number 47. So they love being close to last also. Uh, Virginia's 11. It's not bad. Uh, number one is Utah. For the last few years, they've actually been doing some pretty good things with their uh, tax climate, with their business climate. They've been trying to get businesses to come there. I'm surprised that they're much better than Texas because apparently everybody's moving to Texas. Oh, yeah. Well, that's actually a great point. After the 2010 census, okay, every year, I'm sorry, every 10 years, the United States performs a census to find how many people we have in the country and also uh, what some of their demographics are. They found something very, very interesting after the 2010 census. They found something of biblical proportions, actually. Exodus. They found a mass exodus was occurring in the last 10 years from California to Texas and other, other pro-growth states. By the millions, people have been leaving California to go to places like Texas, places that are having better tax policy, a more of a pro-growth business environment. So literally millions of people, a lot of them in their 20s, just young 20s starting their career, leaving California, going to Texas. One other thing I'd point out is we've all seen this map on election day. Of course, the color's a little bit different. But if you look at the low end, 50, 48, 46, 47, 42, and 38, those are very liberal states. Oh, yeah. That's right. That's right. So I guess giving it away isn't free. Oh, it's not free at all. Uh, and in fact, let me ask you something else about people moving, etc. When you think about Florida, okay, after you've thought about wild spring breaks, what's another thing you think about when you think about for Florida? Old people. Yeah, that's right, old people, the elderly. That's right, retirement communities. Well, what state do you normally think of them coming from? Did New York. Florida? That's right, New York. So basically, what do, you, what do you think about when you think about Florida? You've got, of course, your spring breakers, but then you've got whole communities worth of the elderly folk who have come from places like New York. Now, why is this? We've typically thought that it's because of the climate. Maybe they just like the warm weather, but could there be another reason? They can afford their retirement. <laughs> right. Well, another reason is death taxes. What happens when you die? In other words, um, let's see, who, who can read that? Can anyone read that from where they're sitting? I paid taxes all of my life, and all I got was this lousy t-shirt. That's right. Then you got the IRS tax man saying, tax. that's right, give me the t-shirt too, right? So you pay taxes your whole life. All these taxes we've been talking about, taxes on your cell phone bill, taxes on your cable bill, taxes out of your paycheck, okay, taxes out of your gas. Taxes everywhere, paying to still own your house, paying to still own your car. You work hard, you try to not just take handouts from people, and you die, and the government says, give me some more. I think that is one of the most immoral things I've ever heard of in my life. That even on your way out, they want something. These are commonly called death taxes. So there's at least two ways they can get you. The first is your estate. So that means that you've got a home, maybe you've got some investments, you've got a savings account, maybe you've got some stocks. Well, I think they may let you pay for the funeral costs and some of these things first, but as soon as those things are done, you've got your estate. This is what you're worth, essentially, when you pass away. 
Well, they say, give me a chunk. Before anything else happens to it, give it to me. And then, here's the second way. You want to pass that on to your children? Not so fast, buddy. Inheritance taxes. So, after they've taken away from that first chunk, and you want to give it away to your children, they say, give us some of that chunk too. Before, the, before your children even get it. Death taxes. Why do people work hard in New York, retire, and move to Florida? Because New York has death taxes. Florida doesn't. That's probably just one reason. But that makes sense to me. Let's enter the did you know portion. And um, our time is going to be over somewhat shortly because I know this is a somewhat heavy topic here. But did you know that ancient Rome committed economic suicide? So, yes, of course, there were invasions and there were some military issues there, but essentially, Rome, their citizens got into heavy debt. They got into heavy public debt. In other words, their, their government owed a lot of money. They had handouts and entitlements. Sound familiar? And so, when the invaders came, some said, the soldiers just said, well, I'm not fighting for this. Just go ahead and take it. What are we fighting for here? Now, I'm not saying there wasn't a battle, but the point is, before any invasions occurred to bring Rome down in those final stages, they had already taken themselves out. Did you know that after the Revolutionary War, America had a worthless currency? You think we're bad off now? Yes. We are bad now, but it was said that this currency was so worthless that if someone was trying to pay you back for something they had borrowed, the person receiving the money would run away, try and hide somewhere, because they didn't want to be paid back in this worthless currency. Okay, so you had creditors running from debtors, essentially. Anyone know what this was called? There was even a saying, that's right, it's not worth a continental. A continental. That's right. We had a worthless currency. Did you know, after the Revolutionary War, America was over $75 million in debt, right off the bat? And, of course, we had a worthless currency. So we were in trouble. But, did you know, by 1835, the debt was paid off by President, well, under President Andrew Jackson. Down to zero. We've done it before. Have you heard of German wheelbarrow money? Now, I just sort of made up this, this term. But, essentially, during uh, the period of about 1914 to 1924 in Germany, they had gotten themselves into such economic trouble, they were just printing up money. They thought just printing their money would solve their problems. Does that sound familiar? Mm -hmm. Their money became so worthless, it was said that people were taking their wheelbarrows stacked full of money and suitcases packed full of money to the bakery just to buy a loaf of bread. There was even one story of a gentleman that might have looked just like this, wheeled his money down in front of the bakery, parked his cart there with the stacks of money, went inside to get the bread, came back out to get his money, the money was dumped on the ground, and the cart was stolen. <laughs> Have you heard of the Zimbabwe trillion dollar bill? It's actually a 100 trillion dollar bill. Zimbabwe, around the time of the financial crisis in America that was hitting worldwide, they were printing so much money to deal with their problems that at some point they printed a $100 trillion bill. By 2014, they just gave up. They decided we're not going to have a currency anymore. I mean, seriously, when you get to a $100 trillion bill, you might as well just give up. Uh, my understanding is that now you can go to a, a market there uh, in Zimbabwe and you can buy one of these $100 trillion bills as a souvenir, as sort of a little tourist piece. And you'll pay somewhere between $1 and $10, depending on your bargaining skills. From about 1984 to now, it is said that Japan has had about two lost decades. Now, they're working hard. They're making televisions. They're making computers. They're making vehicles. But because of their government policies, they've had something called stagflation. Now, this is where... The economy shrinks, people are making less money, they may be working hard, but they've got less in their pocket to spend, but at the same time, 
prices are rising. So you've got less money, you're working hard, but prices are rising against you. They've been called the lost decades of Japan. America, as you might have guessed by this point, is on the same economic path as ancient Rome, Germany, and Japan. We've got a little ways till Zimbabwe, but we're on that same path. Economics has principles, just like the laws of nature. If you drop an apple, an apple's gonna fall, no matter where you are in the world. An airplane can fly and defy gravity for a while, but at some point, it's got to come down. Economics has the same sort of principles that are unbreakable. You can defy them for a while, but at some point, that plane's gotta come down. No matter who you are, ancient Rome, Germany, Japan, Zimbabwe, or the United States of America, you're going to reap the consequences if you try to defy those laws. But here's the good news. We've come back before. We had a worthless currency. We had $72 million in debt right after we became a country. By 1835, it was paid off. We've been in trouble before. Japan, they're working hard. They're fighting still. We've come back. Anyone know who this is? Any guesses? This is President Calvin Coolidge. President Calvin Coolidge, if you ask me who my favorite president is, if you just take aside Washington and Jefferson, if you, if you just say, okay, just forget about Reagan for a minute, these are, these are the obvious ones. Coolidge is my man. You may have not known anything about Calvin Coolidge before tonight, but let me tell you, he was really something. He was president from 1923 to 1929. He was actually Warren Harding's vice president till Warren Harding died. And in the middle of the night, up at his dad's home, up in Plymouth Notch, Vermont, his dad was actually a notary public. And so, vice president became president after his father swore him in. Under candlelight, no less. He was so serious about the budget and getting our national finances under control that to set an example, when he became president, his wife was asking, Honey, I don't know what kind of kind of dress I'm going to wear. She was very concerned about what style she should have and how she should look. And Calvin Coolidge said, honey, don't worry about it. We're canceling the ball. So Calvin Coolidge, to show the country how serious he was, canceled the inaugural ball. Imagine if we had a president that did that today. He was so serious about getting the country's financial house in order that in his own house, the White House, if the chef, if the White House chef made too much money or too much food for guests, Calvin would get upset at her. Why'd you make too many turkeys? Well, this is the President of the United States. But he was so serious about it, he wanted to cut non-essentials everywhere he could. After World War I, we also had a tremendous war debt to pay back. In 1913, the government decided, let's start taxing people's incomes. 1913 was when we began the personal income taxes in this country. And also we taxed the rich much more. So we had very high taxes. We had budget deficits. In other words, each year we were spending more than we took in. We had a significant national debt. We had unemployment, etc. Calvin Coolidge during his presidency with the help of some good, good people to advise him paid down the national debt 30%. Didn't pay it off, but 30% started paying it down. He went from having budget deficits to surpluses. The federal government actually had more money than it spent every month or every year. Could you imagine that? We had, that's right, we had some good things under Clinton too. That's right, that's right. And this is when innovation was abounding. We had the Ford Motor Company cranking out those automobiles, making an automobile, automobile affordable for the average person. I believe we had Charles Lindbergh flying around the world. We had appliances entering into homes like washing machines, etc., so that people didn't have to spend all day long performing your basic tasks. And pretty much if you wanted a job, you could have a job. In 1926, the unemployment rate 
was 1.8%. Now, now we're up, up around 7 or 8%, and we're upset about it. If you believe it, there are different, different versions of the rate, but people don't like it when we're at about 7 or 8. Most economists say you can never really get below about 4 or 5%, but Calvin Coolidge had a 1.8% unemployment rate. Now here's the thing. The principles are not complicated. Spend less than you take in. Pay down what you owe. Cut off waste. If you don't need it, don't buy it. These are very simple principles that will help us in personal finances, but will also help our government. They're not complicated. You just need good men and women to put them into practice. So we've been in a tough spot before, and we've gotten out of it before, and we can do it again. Any questions? You really are pretty much an optimist, aren't you? I am. I am. I really am. Well, and you know, I mean, during the Revolutionary War, I mean, we didn't have electricity, all right? We didn't have the internet. We didn't have telephones. I mean, even during this day, guy's day, we didn't have cell phones. We didn't have the internet. All right, I don't even know. We probably didn't have central heating, central cooling. I mean, we've got so much today. I mean, we can spread information literally at a click. So the opportunity, I think, is there. It's just a matter of initializing it. We can have the best days the world's ever seen. Internet and prosperity.